On the 27th of September 1927, on a quiet country lane in Essex, local policeman PC George William Gutteridge was found dead, having suffered multiple gunshot wounds. A police investigation was launched, linking the murder to a stolen car found over 20 miles away in Brixton. Ballistics evidence connected the killing to Clapham based mechanic Frederick Guy Brown. He was arrested along with associate William Kennedy and both men were charged with the murder of PC Gutteridge. Brown protested his innocence, but after a five-day trial was found guilty, and on the 31st of May 1928 at Pentonville Prison in London, he was hanged. That's my mum's mum, Ida, which is Frederick's sister. Today, over 90 years on, the great nieces of Frederick Guy Brown, Una and Barbara, are determined to prove his innocence. Frederick Guy Brown was our grandmother's brother, but different grandmothers. They question the original conviction that's hung over their family for almost a century. It just does seem something not quite right, isn't there? Mm, it doesn't shine. There, there's something quite, not quite right. The case against Brown was a powerful one with damaging witness statements and strong ballistics evidence. But was it a miscarriage of justice? And can a modern day legal team reach a different conclusion? Jeremy Dean QC has over 30 years experience as a barrister and will be leading the defense. Sasha Was QC has successfully brought convictions against some of the UK's most notorious criminals. Barbara and Una have come to London to meet with Sasha and Jeremy. Hello, Yuna. Hello. Sasha. Hello. Barbara. Hi. Hi there, Jeremy. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you too. So, Yuna and Barbara, what is it that interests you most about the case? It's so out of character. Yes. Of somebody of in your family? Of, yes, of yes. the rest of the family. Yes. So, yes. and, and it, it's, it was something never mentioned. Emotionally, would you be pleased if he was thought to be innocent or devastated if he was thought to be guilty or... If it comes to light that the conviction was unsafe, mm -hmm. then it would sad. be very sad. Mm. Because not... It was, you know, he has a wife, he had a daughter. Yeah. yeah. It is interesting because from the little that we know so far, there are some questions that have come up that have left us going... Why would that have been mm. so? Mm. Well, what's going to happen now is Jeremy and I are going to go away and investigate the case, and we will report back to you when we have some news. Yeah, that would be really brilliant. So, lovely That's to lovely. meet you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. We'll see you soon. Born in London in 1881, Frederick Guy Brown was one of eight children. He and his siblings were all given three-letter names. Brown's birth name was Leo. A man of two sides. To his family, he was a loving husband and caring father. Professionally, he was Frederick and known locally as a highly skilled mechanic. But events took a dark turn when police found a stolen car containing evidence that linked Brown to the killing of PC Gutteridge. Was Frederick Guy Brown capable of killing in cold blood? Sasha and Jeremy are starting their investigation by examining the key facts of the case. Well, Sasha, this is the case of Frederick Guy Brown, and it concerns the shooting of a police officer in 1927. Obviously, the murder of a police officer was regarded to be an incredibly serious crime. Frederick Guy Brown was arrested for the murder of PC Gutteridge. He lived in Clapham, and owned a small garage, and he had a, a criminal record. He employed this man, William Kennedy, in his garage, and Kennedy was also arrested for the murder of PC Gutteridge. When Frederick Guy Brown was arrested, he was found with a number of guns in his possession, including an oxidised Webley revolver. So, Sasha, what do you think about this case? I mean, you mustn't forget four guns were found in Frederick Guy Brown's possession. Whether the rifling from those guns is indeed connected to the murder, we will have to have a look at what was said at trial 
And I think we're going to have to look at a, a, a modern-day firearms expert to see whether it, that is a sustainable conclusion by today's scientific standards. At trial, Kennedy ran a cutthroat defence, that is to say he blamed Brown for the murder. I think we should explore the role of William Kennedy and what his relationship actually was with Frederick Guy Brown, whether he had a motive to falsely implicate him. So, I think we'd better get started. I agree. To understand Frederick Guy Brown's case, Barbara and Una are visiting the crime scene where PC Gutteridge was gunned down all those years ago. The road has since been renamed Gutteridge Lane in memory of the fallen officer. Here, they're meeting Bernard Mullen, who's done extensive research on the case. We are standing in the lower part of Gutteridge Lane, and further down the road is where the murder actually took place. In the early hours of the 27th of September, 1927, PC George William Gutteridge was concluding his night shift. His vision saw a car roaring up the road. There weren't many cars in those days. He'd become immediately suspicious. He wanted it to stop. So he blew his whistle. The car stopped. The prosecution case alleged that upon approaching the vehicle, PC Gutteridge saw two men inside. He was in a lot of danger at that time. He was unaware of that. He decided to take notes. He got his pencil out and his policeman's notebook. And with that, there were two very, very quick and close together gunshots. PC Gutteridge was shot twice in the left side of his face. But they weren't happy with that. They got out of the car, they went over and shot him through both eyes at point-blank range with a heavy Webley revolver. Bang, bang. They got in the car and drove away at high speed. His body lay there for nearly three hours until it was discovered. The police were swiftly notified by a local postal worker and the body was moved to a nearby pub to await post-mortem. A murder investigation began, but those that had killed PC Gutteridge in cold blood were still on the loose. It does feel a little odd being here in this lane where this poor policeman was killed. By whom, we're not sure. Mm. Supposedly by a relative of ours. Yes. It's very, it's very uncomfortable feeling. Just hours before the shooting, Essex-based GP, Dr. Edward Lovell, parked his blue Morris Cowley in his lock garage. The following morning, the car was gone. Jeremy and Sasha are analyzing the movements of the stolen vehicle. What evidence was there to link the car to the murder of PC Gutteridge? Let's have a look at a map of London and Essex just so we have an idea of where the important things in this case actually happened. Now, over there in Billericay, Dr Lovell's car was stolen at about half past two in the morning. Over in the middle, marked crime scene, is where PC Gutteridge was last seen alive at three o'clock in the morning, so half an hour after that. And then down here in Brixton, was where Dr. Lovell's car, having been stolen in Billericay the night before, was found abandoned. And interestingly, Brixton was within a mile of Brown's garage, which was in Clapham. Now, firstly, the mileage fitted in with the pattern of the car having been driven from Billericay to the crime scene and onto Brixton. Secondly, blood was found on the running board of the car. And thirdly, medical equipment was left by Dr Lovell in his car when he parked it at Billericay. No medical equipment was found in the car when the car was retrieved at Brixton. And medical equipment of the same type was found at Frederick Guy Brown's garage 
when police searched it four months later. The prosecution weren't able to prove that the medical equipment taken from the doctor's car in Biririki was the very medical equipment found in Frederick Guy Brown's garage. Jeremy, you're absolutely right. Dr Lovell said, this is the type of um, medical material that I'm missing, exactly the same. I can't say it is uh, the precise implement. He said that the medical equipment in his garage amounted to useful tools of his trade. So, according to him, he did have good reason to possess that medical equipment. Well, he offered an explanation which the jury could believe or not. It's also important to note that um, Frederick Guy Brown had an alibi. His wife and his landlady both said that they had no recollection of him staying away from home or being away from home generally, let alone in late September. So this is a further matter that needs to be taken into consideration. I agree, Jeremy, and I think the way we should approach it is, is simply to recognise he put an alibi forward, but it wasn't a watertight alibi. Well, let, let's, let's reflect on that. All right. While family man Leo Brown was a reputable mechanic, his Frederick Guy persona had a history of petty crime. But murder was not on his list of prior offences. To learn more about Brown's character, Barbara and Una have come to Clapham to meet historian Josh Levine. Was their great uncle really the type of man that would kill an unarmed police officer? Officially, in all the court documents, in all the official documents you find, he's known uh, as Frederick Guy. But in all letters he writes, he signs himself off as Leo. It's almost as though he has two identities. If you look through, so you look through his previous convictions, so most of his previous convictions are, you know, they're, they're, they're not violence, they're theft, they're fraud. He doesn't drink. No. He doesn't smoke. No. He doesn't gamble. He goes, you he know, He doesn't great have pains. any of those. I, he says, I have no vices. Mm. A couple of things I found here. When he was convicted, there was a group set up which fought for justice for Brown. Now, the person who is really instigating this justice for Brown yeah. is this man, Arthur Finch. Yeah. Now, he is whom? He is my grandfather. In one of these papers, your grandfather goes into quite a lot of detail about why he thinks there's been a miscarriage of justice. He says, Brown is a bandit with an utter disregard of the consequences of his action to himself and others. Bear in mind, he's writing this with the intention of getting him off. Yeah. It is unthinkable that he should have killed Gutteridge while that unfortunate man was lying wounded on the ground. So he's not trying to paint him as a good man. No. He's saying that he's a hot-tempered yep. bandit. But at the same time, just because he is this yep. kind of person does, does not does mean, mean, mean that he's committed this murder. Yep. Yeah. I may be horrible, but not yeah. necessarily a killer. So we've seen what an interesting man fascinating man Frederick is with these two sides to him but what none of this actually really tells us is was he a murderer was he guilty mm. I don't think he would have killed him cold blood four months after PC Guttridge's death Brown was arrested for an unrelated car theft shockingly police found several guns in Brown's car and in his garage as part of their investigation, Sasha and Jeremy are meeting forensic firearms expert, Mark Mestaglio. Was there a definite link between the guns recovered in Brown's car and the murder? So, Mark, you have here a selection of firearms and ammunition, which is all relevant to the case that we're yes. dealing with. Can you talk us through mm. each sure. of them, please? Well, here we have a Webley Mark 6.455 um, revolver. This is the gun, or the same type of gun, yes. that was found in Frederick Guy Brown's car, loaded when he was arrested. Correct. This model of firearm was said to be the murder weapon in the case of Frederick Guy Brown. Indeed. Obviously, anyone could have fired that gun. Oh, yes. All my discipline can show is a specific gun fired a specific piece of ammunition. It doesn't identify the man. We also know that um, one bullet casing yes. was found in a car 
that had been stolen from a Dr Lovell. The forensic scientist at trial yes. expressed the opinion that it was beyond reasonable doubt mm. that the casing had mm -hmm. been fired from the gun yes. found yes. Um, in uh, yes. Brown's car. Is that a conclusion that is sustainable mm. under the modern-day uh, analysis? I've looked at... Um, and some excellent... I have to say excellent work was done in this case um, from three individuals concerned with the examination of the cartridge case. They've looked at the damage transferred uh, from the beach face transferred to the cartridge, and they've also looked at the firing pin right. damage. And I have no doubt that that gun had fired... The, that cartridge from that gun or, or or a gun of that type specifically from that gun specifically from that gun yes beyond reasonable doubt it's my opinion that the level of agreement is such that one can exclude any other gun thank you very much mark that's been that's extremely interesting mark mustaglio's evidence was really interesting first of all he has completely validated the findings of the original expert at trial Mark is confident that the shell casing found in Dr Lovell's car was fired from the gun found in Brown's car. That is a critical piece of evidence against Brown implicating him in the murder of PC Gutteridge. William Kennedy, an employee of Frederick Guy Brown, was said to have been with Brown during the murder. Kennedy told police he was an innocent bystander while Brown gunned down PC Gutteridge in cold blood. But what sort of man was William Kennedy? Barbara and Una are back with case expert Bernard Mullen to find out more. So we know that Frederick was known by the police. Is it the same with Kennedy? Well, William Henry Kennedy had a very, very colourful background. He was convicted for indecent exposure, thieving, you name it, he did it. Kennedy, subsequently, after the Guttridge murder, went and got married and moved to Liverpool. But the police were on to him. Sergeant Mattison of the Liverpool City Police knew him because he'd frequented the area before. He knew his record. He knew what he's capable of. He crept up behind him as he saw him walking down the street and said, come on, Bill, it's up. Kennedy spun round and he pulled a savage automatic pistol from his pocket, shoved it between his ribs and pulled the trigger. There was a click. The safety catch was on. Oh. Sergeant Mattison grabbed his hand, smacked him in the face. Mm. Kennedy went down. When they'd got Kennedy off the ground, he turned and said to Mattison, you should be in heaven by now. It seems quite obvious that he's not a very nice man, no. doesn't it, really? Mm. No. And he's probably the one that... Seems that way, doesn't it? Questionable, very questionable, I would say. During the police investigation, Kennedy made a statement that heavily implicated Brown in the murder of PC Gutteridge. Sasha and Jeremy are meeting psychologist Dr Roberta Babb to determine if there could be any truth in Kennedy's words. Was this an accurate version of events? Or could Kennedy have simply been trying to shift the blame onto Brown? Can I ask you about your opinion in relation to Kennedy's behaviour when he was seen by the police? Would you agree that he was sort of weighing up the options? Of whether to talk or not to talk, definitely. Yeah. He had a lot to lose. When he actually makes the statement, the police officer concerned, Chief Inspector James Barrett, says, quote, during the whole course of my experience, I've never taken a statement from a man who exercised such care. And he was asking for passages to be read back over and over again. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a sort of global view of what Kennedy's state of mind is likely to have been at, at the time we've just been discussing? Well, I think at the time of discussing, Kennedy is very unsure about what to say. I mean, he is a well-known criminal, so he has the convict code, which you don't grasp, you don't snitch. So that's one thing that's going to be in his mind. However, he knows that he's involved or being implicated in a crime that actually involves the death of a policeman. So he kind of doesn't know where to sit. And we don't know, for example, if there was a suggestion that if he gives up a name, he may get a lesser charge. 
So there's a lot of things going on in his mind. I think he's really torn between two positions and he doesn't know. But what we can see from his statement is the fact that he's actually trying very hard not to implicate himself. Yeah. We know that Kennedy had only been married for a short space of time. Mm -hmm. On the premise that he had married her because he loved her, his incentive for lying would be that much greater, wouldn't it? Most definitely, yes. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. In April 1928, Frederick Guy Brown and William Kennedy were tried together at the Old Bailey. The statement Kennedy made to the police was read out in court, but the judge directed the jury to disregard it when considering their verdict for the charges against Brown. Prior to the trial, the Gutteridge murder case was widely reported in the press, naming Brown and Kennedy as the suspects. Barbara and Una are visiting Clapham Library to read about the trial from newspapers of the time. Brown always protested his innocence, but were the jury influenced by the media? The judge is telling the jury that they must not be influenced by any prepossessions or ideas they might have entertained before they came into the jury box. Mm. I don't think they... I, once right, you, I don't once think you it, know something, you, yeah, can't, you can't, un can't unknow it. You can't unknow it. But and it's bound to have an impact on how you think about a person. Yes. You know, a negative portrayal in the yeah. press is going to lead to a, an, a you know, a, a biased decision. Well, if you're told that somebody is a master criminal, yeah. you and have... Bad and you, yeah, like, and has, yeah. is bad and has done this and carries guns and deals with guns and all that sort of stuff, that is in your head. There's no two ways about it. Yeah. That would be... You would you have really formed have an opinion yeah. of sorts. Yeah. But had they already been judged in the press? Yes, had people probably. already decided that they were guilty? I don't think he really stood a chance from the beginning. No. I because think... a policeman had been yeah. killed and whoever happened to come into the frame yeah. would have had the book thrown at them yeah. because it was a, a horrible murder. Yeah. It, I mean, there's, a, there's no denying that it was a ghastly, ghastly thing. On the fifth and final day of the trial, the jury retired to consider their verdict. Jeremy is concerned about the directions the judge gave to the jury regarding Kennedy's statement. Could this have resulted in an unfair trial. In my view, Brown had a strong argument for severance, that is a separate trial from Kennedy, because Kennedy's statement was not just a one-liner, it was a very detailed, picturesque, damaging account. And the way I read Kennedy's statement is that it was clearly designed to lay the blame on Brown. And, and exonerate to, Kennedy. And to exonerate Kennedy. There was a vivid description of how out of nothing Brown had shot the police officer uh, repeatedly. Kennedy's statement is long and it, and it goes into intricate detail about how he, Kennedy, innocent, sitting there, watched Brown out of the blue shoot P.C. Guttridge. And it must have been very, very difficult for the jury to ignore that statement and it required the most powerful of directions from the judge. Judge gave what I think was a token direction. Did the judge give an adequate direction? I I'm going to suggest he did. Firstly, I don't agree mm -hmm. that the judge's direction was sufficient. Well, Jeremy, we can go round the houses Sasha, about whether it was sufficient finish. or not. In this case, Kennedy's statement was incredibly detailed. Yes. And when you stand that very detailed statement against the brief direction given, which was repeated in passing, I don't think it was sufficient. There was a direct connection between Brown and the firearm that had been used to kill PC Gutteridge. That was the strongest part of the prosecution case. And that alone was sufficient to allow the jury to return a guilty verdict against Brown. But we don't know whether they would have done that, albeit that you might be correct that that evidence was sufficient, had they not had this picturesque, compelling account advanced by Kennedy in the absence of anything other than what I regard to be a token direction by the judge. It is my view that Brown's trial was unfair as a consequence. The evident, uh, evidence against Brown alone 
was more than sufficient to enable the jury to return a guilty verdict of murder. We're not going to agree on this. Point. We're not going to agree on this, no. Officially, Kennedy's statement made no difference to the case against Brown because it wasn't admissible. The problem is that it was so detailed and implicated Brown so heavily and so picturesquely that, in my view, no jury could possibly escape from the rigours of Kennedy's statement. On the 27th of April, 1928, the jury found both Frederick Guy Brown and William Kennedy guilty, and they were sentenced to death. In Pentonville Prison, while awaiting execution, the man known to his family as Leo Brown wrote an article about his secret life as a criminal. Could this account shed light on Brown's reasons for turning to crime? Reynolds Illustrated News published this article written by Frederick, Frederick Guy, Guy Brown. Brown. And he talks about how he's, yes, I am a bad lot. So he's made himself a criminal? Or society. Society. Society hit hard at me. But no, because it didn't for the rest of the family. He just went a different way. Yeah. Well, maybe he was just in a different environment. Oh, God, look at this. Last but not least, my deep and abiding affection for my wife and child. What I love for my dear family has driven me to break the law, unknown to them many times. That's for making money, but this then. is not the place to get sentimental. Yeah, so what he was I... a criminal. Yes, but that doesn't necessarily make him a murderer. He accepts the fact he was a criminal and he did bad things and things he shouldn't have done, but he's got nothing to lose, really. No. There's nothing particularly violent in there. No. Three years after the trial, the senior investigator in the case, James Barrett, wrote an article for a national newspaper which contains information that Jeremy finds concerning. Could this be the key to clearing Brown's name? Chief Inspector Barrett had said that at the earliest stages of the inquiry, he had no suspicion that Brown was connected with the murder. But he gave contradictory account in his article in The People, saying that he'd become convinced that Brown was mixed up with the murder, even if he'd not actually committed it. For me, there's an atmosphere of suspicion about the conduct of the police, which arises from certain of the circumstances pertaining at the time, it seems to, to be the case that this was a classic verbals case where Brown was fitted up by police officers and attributed comments that have a stench about them. Brown allegedly said on being shown the nickel-plated revolver taken from his home, oh, you found that, have you? That's no good. It would only tickle you unless it hit you in a vital part. If you stopped me when I was in the car, I should have shot five of you and saved the other one for myself. This reads to me like verbals, like the old-fashioned, we're going to fit this guy up and make sure he's convicted of murder. Mm. And this is, on that basis, a, a, a truly concerning feature of the case. Jeremy, I agree that those words alleged to have been said by Brown do not have the ring of truth about them. Um, but before we can start suggesting that this entire case was a fit-up, just remember that the evidence against Brown, the most important evidence against Brown, was the connection between the shell casing in Dr Lovell's car and the gun which Brown admitted was his gun. We don't know on what basis the jury convicted him of murder. This evidence was relied on by the prosecution. It is, it is clearly tainted. Do you yourself accept? I completely agree. Yeah. Yes, completely. And on that basis, Brown did not receive a fair trial, and there is, in my view, a question mark over the safety of his conviction. On the 31st of May, 1928, at Pentonville Prison, the convicted criminal Frederick Guy Brown was executed and buried within the prison walls. But those that knew him as Leo mourned the loss of a loving family man. To pay their respects to their great uncle, 
Barbara and Una have come to the church in Clapham, where Brown was married. And of course, we've got some letters here that he wrote to his wife from prison. My dearest wife, just pull your socks up, you understand me? You say you feel confident that we shall be together again. Let us hope so. At the same time, do not rely on it too much. Just prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Cheer up, for life is all a game. I wish I were with you to give you an hour's happy thoughts. I will close until I see you again. Always your loving husband, Leo. Yes, darling, I see you have little to write about, but even so, one word in times is a lot when the right kind from the right one. <sighs> Was he in the car? Did he shoot the policeman? No. No, I don't think so either. But we'll never know. Sasha and Jeremy have completed their investigation and must now put their submissions before the judge. The firearms evidence in this case is compelling, and that has been confirmed by Mark Mastaglio. Um, so I think Jeremy's got a problem on his hands. In terms of the way the trial was conducted, there are some very worrying features of what took place, and those are the aspects of the case that I'm going to be putting under the spotlight before Judge Radford. For Una and Barbara, this is the chance for them to clear their relative's name after over 90 years. Hello, Barbara and Una. Hello. Hi. Hello. Good to see you. Hello. Nice to see you again. See you again. Good to see you. Cheers. How are you feeling today? We're hoping that you've got something to present to him that will right. give Persuade us a positive. Yes. Yeah. 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 Give us a positive. Well, we have looked in a lot of detail at the circumstances of the case, and Sasha and I have, have liaised, but obviously we'll make our individual submissions to the judge. Yes, so if you follow us, we'll go this way, and um, then we'll go into the judge's room, all right? Yes. Sasha and Jeremy must now present their arguments to Judge David Radford. As a senior judge for over 14 years, he's tried some of the country's highest profile murder cases. But what will he make of this brutal killing? Good morning. Please take a seat. I'm here today for me to consider, with the assistance of Learned Counsel, the safety of the conviction on the 27th of April, 1928, of Frederick Guy Brown for the murder of Police Constable Gutteridge. Mr. Dean, would you like to yes. start? Thank you very much indeed. So the first argument I advance on behalf of Mr. Brown is that the judge ought to have granted separate trials and allowed Mr. Brown to be tried without the unanswerable prejudice of Mr. Kennedy's statement featuring in his trial. And Roberta Babb, a modern-day psychologist who assisted us in the course of this inquiry, described how Kennedy would have had so much to lose and would have been motivated to say absolutely anything to save himself in the difficult circumstances of this case. Of course, at the very heart of my submission is the fact that what Kennedy said in his statement was not admissible evidence against Mr. Brown, and that, therefore, it was incumbent upon the judge to give the clearest possible legal directions to the jury in order to protect the interests of Mr. Brown. And although the judge did, on, I think, up to five occasions, refer to the legal principle that what Kennedy said in the absence of Brown was not evidence against Brown, the directions were short and cursory and did not sufficiently spell out or emphasise that it was incumbent upon the jury to ignore the detail, that it was irrelevant and that it should play no part in their consideration of the case 
concerning Mr Brown. Finally, I come to the third basis upon which I invite Your Honour to consider Mr Brown's conviction to be unsafe, the stench of police corruption. Firstly, an alleged conversation between the police and Brown went before the jury, and it was of the type that would be regarded as inadmissible because it's so obviously verbals type evidence, and that this evidence would not have been admissible or featured in a modern day trial. And for all those reasons, it's my submission that Your Honour should treat the conviction of Mr. Brown as unsafe and declare in those terms. Thank you very much, Mr. Dean. Ms. Wass, would you like to respond? Kennedy did not give evidence but implicated Brown in his statement to the police. The judge gave clear and repeated directions. Uh, Mr uh, Dean identified five separate occasions when the judge told the jury to ignore what Kennedy had said when they came to deliberate the guilt or innocence of Brown. And those directions peppered throughout the whole of the summing up could not have been clearer. But ultimately, it was not the statement of Kennedy that convicted Brown. The car of Dr Lovell was driven from Essex, where it had originally been stolen, to Brixton, less than a mile away from Brown's garage, where Kennedy worked. In that car was found a spent shell case, which, according to the evidence of Mark Mustaglio, was undoubtedly fired from the Webley revolver that was found in the driver's side of Brown's motor car. Exhibit 17 at the trial. Exhibit 17 at the trial. The experts at the time made that point. Mr Mustaglio was in no doubt that that case was fired from that gun. There was simply no two ways about it. Brown himself had four loaded revolvers when he was arrested by the police. And as I have explained to you, Your Honour, one of those firearms, the Webley, was compellingly connected with the shooting. Separate trials in my submission would have made absolutely no difference whatsoever to the verdict in this case. And there is no reason to suggest that that verdict was unsafe. Thank you for your submissions, Mr Dean, Ms Wass. I'd be grateful if you'd give me some time now to reflect upon them, and to re-examine the papers which I've looked at before, and then in due course to let you know what my conclusion is about this case. Thank you. The legal arguments have now been presented to Judge Radford, but has Jeremy done enough to question the original conviction? So do you remain hopeful or...? Uh... Um, no. You don't? <laughs> no. Why? Up until we went and had the chat, I was quite positive it was going yep. to be unsound. But yep. I don't think so anymore. I think he was as guilty as sin. <laughs> do you? You think yes. Frederick Brown was guilty yeah, as sin? I do. All right. Did Frederick Guy Brown shoot PC Gutteridge in cold blood? Or did his co-defendant act alone? And was Brown the victim of an unfair trial? The judge is now ready to deliver his verdict. The prosecution case at trial was that both defendants were guilty together as joint principal offenders in both the theft of the Morris Cowley and then the shooting of the officer who tried to thwart them from getting away with the crime. In such a case such as this, for the evidence to have been heard twice and for the competing cases for the accused not to have been weighed by the same jury would have been wrong. In my judgment, the trial judge's decision cannot sensibly be faulted. It is clear to me too that the judge repeatedly gave clear and correct directions to the jury that what Kennedy had said in his police statement was evidence for and against him only and not against Brown. His directions in my view were clear and sufficient. 
Mr. Dean's further accusation of police corruption is in reality not founded on any proper evidential basis. Both defendants gave written statements, not merely verbal ones, to the police. The case against Brown rested on the linking of the cartridge in the stolen car to whose possession of the murder weapon from which it had been fired. There was, in my view, powerful evidence of his guilt. I am entirely satisfied that Mr. Brown received a fair trial and that his conviction for murder was indeed a safe one. I shall now rise. You've obviously been on this journey now and spent a lot of time and emotional energy invested on it. Were you glad that you, you, you took oh, it? Oh, we're very no, glad. It was very, very interesting. Mm. We had no knowledge mm. of this incident mm. and mm -hmm. what happened to him. Mm -hmm. So this has all been, it has all been very interesting. He had his at home husband, father, and came across as a very loving man in his letters. But then take him away from that, and he becomes Frederick, a rogue, a criminal, and so, yes. But did he deserve to die for being a rogue? Well, it, yes, but he, he, we will be arguing this for a very long time. Yes, we will. <laughs> The British justice system is the envy of the world. But in the past, mistakes have been made. Over the last 150 years, approximately 1,500 people have been hanged in the United Kingdom. Many of those desperately protested their innocence. Some of these long-standing convictions could be a miscarriage of justice. The evidence is so overwhelming that they have to tell the truth. In this series, a living relative will attempt to clear their family name. Questionable, very questionable, I would say. Searching for new evidence. They went over and shot him through both eyes. With help from two of the UK's leading barristers, one for the defence. There is a world of difference between an unpleasant journey and murder. And one for the prosecution. He cut off her head, dismembered her, and buried her in a place where he hoped she would never be found. They're on a mission to solve a mystery, submitting their findings to a Crown Court judge. Your Honour ought to declare the conviction for murder to be unsafe. Thank you both for your submissions. I shall consider these matters for myself. Can this modern investigation rewrite history? Sasha and Jeremy have completed their investigation and must now put their submissions before the judge. The firearms evidence in this case is compelling and that has been confirmed by Mark Mastaglio. Um, so I think Jeremy's got a problem on his hands. In terms of the way the trial was conducted, there are some very worrying features of what took place. <laughs> today for me to consider with the assistance of learned counsel the safety 
of the conviction on the 27th of April, 1928, of Frederick Guy Brown for the murder of Police Constable Gutteridge. Mr. Dean, would you like to yes. start? Thank you very much indeed. So the first argument I advance on behalf of Mr. Brown is that the judge ought to have granted separate trials and allowed Mr. Brown to be tried without the unanswerable prejudice of Mr. Kennedy's statement featuring in his trial. And Roberta Babb, a modern-day psychologist who assisted us in the course of this inquiry, described how Kennedy would have had so much to lose and would have been motivated to say absolutely anything to save himself in the difficult circumstances of this case. Of course, at the very heart of my submission is the fact that what Kennedy said in his statement was not admissible evidence against Mr. Brown, and that, therefore, it was incumbent upon the judge to give the clearest possible legal directions to the jury in order to protect the interests of Mr. Brown. And although the judge did, on, I think, up to five occasions, refer to the legal principle that what Kennedy said in the absence of Brown was not evidence against Brown. The directions were short and cursory and did not sufficiently spell out or emphasise that it was incumbent upon the jury to ignore the detail, that it was irrelevant and that it should play no part in their consideration of the case concerning Mr Brown. Finally, I come to the third basis upon which I invite Your Honour to consider Mr Brown's conviction to be unsafe, the stench of police corruption. Firstly, an alleged conversation between the police and Brown went before the jury, and it was of the type that would be regarded as inadmissible because it's so obviously verbal's type evidence, and that this evidence would not have been admissible or featured in a modern-day trial and for all those reasons, it's my submission that Your Honour should treat the conviction of Mr Brown as unsafe and declare in those terms. Thank you very much, Mr Dean. Ms Wass, would you like to respond? Kennedy did not give evidence, but implicated Brown in his statement to the police. The judge gave clear and repeated directions uh, Mr. Uh, Dean identified five separate occasions when the judge told the jury to ignore what Kennedy had said when they came to deliberate the guilt or innocence of Brown. And those directions, peppered throughout the whole of the summing up, could not have been clearer. But ultimately, it was not the statement of Kennedy that convicted Brown. The car of Dr Lovell was driven from Essex, where it had originally been stolen, to Brixton, less than a mile away from Brown's garage, where Kennedy worked. In that car was found a spent shell case, which, according to the evidence of Mark Mastaglio, was undoubtedly fired from the Webley revolver that was found in the driver's side of Brown's motor car. Exhibit 17 at the trial. Exhibit 17 at the trial. The experts at the time made that point. Mr Mastaglia was in no doubt that that case was fired from that gun. There was simply no two ways about it. Brown himself had four loaded revolvers when he was arrested by the police. And as I have explained to you, Your Honour, one of those firearms, the Webley, was compellingly connected with the shooting. Separate trials, in my submission, would have made absolutely no difference whatsoever to the verdict in this case. And there is no reason to suggest that that verdict was unsafe. 
Thank you for your submissions, Mr. Dean, Ms. Wass. I'd be grateful if you'd give me some time now to reflect upon them, and to re-examine the papers which I've looked at before, and then in due course to let you know what my conclusion is about this case. Thank you. The legal arguments have now been presented to Judge Radford, but has Jeremy done enough to question the original conviction? So do you remain hopeful or...? Uh, no. You don't? <laughs> no. Why? Up until we went and had the chat, I was quite positive it was going yep. to be unsound, but yep. I don't think so anymore. I think he was as guilty as sin. <laughs> do you? Do you think yes. Frederick Brown was guilty yes, as sin? I do. All right. Did Frederick Guy Brown shoot PC Gutteridge in cold blood? Or did his co-defendant act alone? And was Brown the victim of an unfair trial? The judge is now ready to deliver his verdict. The prosecution case at trial was that both defendants were guilty together as joint principal offenders in both the theft of the Morris Cowley and then the shooting of the officer who tried to thwart them from getting away with the crime. In such a case such as this, for the evidence to have been heard twice and for the competing cases for the accused not to have been weighed by the same jury would have been wrong. In my judgment, the trial judge's decision cannot sensibly be faulted. It is clear to me too that the judge repeatedly gave clear and correct directions to the jury that what Kennedy had said in his police statement was evidence for and against him only and not against Brown. His directions, in my view, were clear and sufficient. Mr. Dean's further accusation of police corruption is in reality not founded on any proper evidential basis. Both defendants gave written statements, not merely verbal ones, to the police. The case against Brown rested on the linking of the cartridge in the stolen car to whose possession of the murder weapon from which it had been fired. There was, in my view, powerful evidence of his guilt. I am entirely satisfied that Mr. Brown received a fair trial and that his conviction for murder was indeed a safe one. I shall now rise.